Just a quick reminder that one of the best things you can do to help support the CyberWire is to leave a review for us on iTunes, and also you can help spread the word among your friends, coworkers, and colleagues. Thanks. Shipping giant Clarkson's refuses to pay hackers extortion. The U.S. House may be reaching consensus on surveillance authorities. Inscom mops up red disk leak. The U.S. Defense Department may have more work to do countering insider threats. HP denies reports of spyware in its PCs. Apple fixes High Sierra. Credit services think through the implications of DDPR. And snack foods, a guilty mind, Faraday cages, and employment law. A quick note about our sponsors at E8 Security. They understand the difference between a buzzword and a real solution, and they can help you disentangle them too, especially when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence. You can get a free white paper that explains these new but proven technologies at e8security.com slash cyberwire. We all know that human talent is as necessary to good security as it is scarce and expensive. But machine learning and artificial intelligence can help your human analysts scale to meet the challenges of today's and tomorrow's threats. They'll help you understand your choices, too. Did you know that while we might assume supervised machine learning, where a human teaches the machine, might seem the best approach, in fact, unsupervised machine learning can show the human something unexpected. Cut through the glare of information overload and move from data to understanding. Check out e8security.com slash cyberwire and find out more. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the Cyberwire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire summary for Thursday, November 30th, 2017. Clarkson's, the UK-based global shipping company, said its network had been compromised by criminals who accessed proprietary information and demanded ransom in exchange for keeping the information unannounced. Clarkson's declined to pay and turned the matter over to the police. The criminals appear to have achieved access through a single compromised legitimate user's account, which has since been disabled, not by exploiting a software vulnerability. U.S. Representative Adam Schiff, a Democrat from California, ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, says the committee is close to consensus on how to reform and reauthorize Section 702 Foreign Electronic Surveillance Authorities. Section 702 sunsets at the end of this month, so the deadline is approaching. HP denies media reports that its PCs came preloaded with spyware that surreptitiously reported usage data back to HP without users' permission. The accusations surrounded the company's touchpoint analytics, which do report performance data, HP says, but only with users' permission. HP's VP of Customer Experience for Personal Systems, Mike Nash, told CRN that you have to click yes or no. If you click nothing, we take that as a no. Apple has patched the root vulnerability in macOS High Sierra. The upgrade appears to be quick and painless to install. All Mac users are advised to do so. Call Credit, Equifax, and Experian are said to be preparing for GDPR implementation by working on a Credit Reference Agency Information Notice, or CRANE. The document is intended to bring Credit Bureau use of personal information into line with the EU's pending requirements. Silance recently released a report based on a survey of over 650 industry professionals titled Artificial Intelligence in the Enterprise. Sean Walsh is Senior Vice President of Marketing at Silance, and he shares what they learned. If you look at the RSA conference last year, I don't think you could walk by a booth that didn't say they were using either AI or machine learning. The question became, if it's become an overused, overhyped term, what is really being done with it by IT people who do this for a living? Are they taking the risk or are they sitting back and watching? As you can imagine, AI can sometimes be a polarizing topic. You know, we have people like Elon Musk and others out there that are concerned about certain capabilities of AI. But when you look at it from an IT perspective, you know, are people sharing those concerns or are they looking at this as a better mousetrap to solve the existing business problems they have today? And I think what the survey bore out is that they do see it as a better mousetrap. Someday in the future, it might be a different tool. But today, we think this is the the state-of-the-art in terms of looking at how to prevent and predict attacks. Take us through some of the key findings from the survey. 
Yeah, so I think the biggest thing that surprised me when I looked at it was they said that 60% of IT decision makers say they're already using AI-powered technology in their data center. Uh, That was a number that I expected to be much lower. Now, when you talk about across a data center, there's probably dozens and dozens of applications that they're including in the generic AI area, not just specifically uh, security-related items. And then the next big thing that really surprised me is that they said 93% said AI will create new jobs. You know, that's one of the knocks that people have against any major generational churn of technology is will it take jobs away? And the part that happens in every major generational turn of technology from the industrial revolution through the computer age, through all these different changes is that ultimately more jobs are created. They're different jobs than we had before, but there is no shortage of new jobs that are created. So I I guess one of the things that this survey bears out is that um, people are looking to AI to help fill that gap. Yeah, and and that's really what it is. It's about scaling the workforce today and in the future so that you can reapply those resources to better tools. Um, One of the papers we have published on our website is a a survey that Forrester did on a total economic impact study. And what they said was, look, this is really, really simple for us with your AI-based solutions. We used to have six people managing desktop solutions across our 3,500-person organization. I was able to make that two people, and I took those other four individuals, and I put them on a next-generation project that took them out of maintenance mode and put them into proactive improvement mode. And that's what people like about AI, is it lets them scale, it lets them have better visibility into what the problems are they face, and that they can get more scale out of the human beings that are involved. It is an augmentation. It is not a replacement. That's Sean Walsh from Silance. A note about our interview with Silance's Sean Walsh. Silance is our sustaining sponsor and has a long and, on our part, much valued relation with the Cyberwire. But we interview Sean not for this reason, but because we think he has something interesting to say about artificial intelligence. We appreciate Silance's sponsorship, but with interviews like this, they go through the same process as everyone else. It's not pay-for-play, and neither we nor they would have it any other way. And finally, for your consideration, here's some creative slacking. Not that we recommend this pro tip from Down Under. A gentleman in Western Australia was dismissed from his position at water management joint venture Aruna Alliance when it was determined that he was not, in fact, out on the job troubleshooting water distribution issues, but instead out on the links shooting a few rounds of golf. Well, actually, it wasn't a few, but more like 140, give or take a few bogeys and birdies and 19th holes. Mr. Tom Colella, age 60 and an electrician, was disappointed in his efforts to get the Australian Fair Work Commission to overturn his dismissal. The gentleman had evidently been in the habit of placing his GPS-enabled personal digital assistant inside a snack bag, thereby shielding it from monitoring by his employer. Managers at Aruna Alliance apparently knew he liked to keep his PDA and crisps together, but evidently mentally wrote this off as a charming eccentricity until, hey, well, wait a minute, where is this guy anyway? The judgment of Fair Work Commissioner Bernie Riordan is worth quoting in full, especially since it offers some perspective on professional knowledge and professional responsibility. Quote, I have taken into account that Mr. Colella openly stored his PDA device in an empty foil twisties bag. As an experienced electrician, Mr. Colella knew that this bag would work as a Faraday cage, thereby preventing the PDA from working properly, especially the provision of regular GPS coordinate updates. Mr. Colella went out of his way to hide his whereabouts. He was concerned about Aruna tracking him when the company introduced the PDA into the workplace. He protested about Aruna having this information at that time. Mr. Colella then went out of his way to inhibit the functionality of the PDA by placing it in a foil bag to create a Faraday cage. End quote. The snack brand preferred by Mr. Colella was Twisties, a corn-based cheese curl which comes in a variety of appealing flavors, including original cheese, chicken, Hawaiian pizza, sweet butter toffee, spice burger, and our favorite, the now sadly discontinued Bag of Ghosts, always a crowd pleaser around Halloween. It's unclear whether the flavor affected the electromagnetic performance of the bag, but it seems a safe bet that the aluminized Mylar bags would all exhibit some degree of Faraday shielding. So don't try this around your workplace, friends, no matter how hard you're working on your handicap. 
You're not going to turn into Greg the Shark Norman in any case, and you're not going to be able to claim lack of mens rea if you have any electrical knowledge at all. But a question. Would this kind of hack work equally well with Utz potato chips, much favored along the Baltimore-Harrisburg-Pittsburgh line? And would maybe the bags for the Old Bay crab chip flavored items be a good choice for a Faraday cage? You know, if you, like, sealed the bag and grounded it. Just asking for a friend. Time to share some news from our sponsor, Silence. Silence has integrated its artificially intelligent Silence Protect engine into VirusTotal. You'll know VirusTotal as the free online service that analyzes files and URLs to identify viruses, worms, trojans, and the other kinds of badness antivirus engines and website scanners pick up. Well, Silence has pledged to help VirusTotal in its mission of making the security industry more perceptive and the Internet a safer place. It's like public health for cyberspace. Free tools and services help keep everyone's risk down. Silence sees their predictive approach to security as a contribution to the fight against cyber attacks, and they're now fully integrated as one of the analysis engines available in VirusTotal. Visit Silence.com and look at their blog for more on their contribution to our online immune system. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Robert M. Lee. He's the CEO at Dragos. Uh, Robert, welcome back. Um, you know, I thought we could run through some of the ICS environments that uh, you all deal with. And why don't we start with um, natural gas? Give us an idea here in the United States. What is the, the lay of the land with our natural gas system? How is it controlled? And what are the threats? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to natural gas, it's at a, an interesting changing point for the industry. Um, for years, although it was still critical and important, there wasn't as much national attention on it because it wasn't as critical to the bulk of electric system. Um, as we have moved away from coal and moved more towards renewable sources, we still need a quick way to be able to generate power, which is natural gas. And so natural gas is starting to feed the electric grid much more so. Uh, even a lot of uh, larger energy companies buying up natural gas companies, which means that that national focus has definitely increased. There are threats that have targeted natural gas already, and we've heard about these over the years. We've never seen destruction or disruption as a result of an intentional attack. Um, but of course, it's still something that weighs very heavily on the folks' minds, especially when we start seeing the criticality of the industry increase. What, what they're sort of up against today is a variety of, of risk that they're trying to mitigate. One of the factors for them is they do have sort of that traditional SCADA approach, meaning uh, very long distances, right? A lot of pipelines, mm -hmm. um, very large landscape that they have to cover, as well as very boutique kind of systems. You know, gas compressor station along the side of a pipeline is not really normal um, knowledge for a lot of those, even in the industrial control security community. Um, so for them, they're trying to reduce that risk, not only the physical threats and the things they have to deal with, like crazies along the pipelines, but also in the fact that their threats can get out to those locations. And it's not some easily tapped infrastructure. It's not like they could drive to every single gas compressor station and every single aspect of the pipeline and storage wells and all that and throw a managed switch on there and start tapping that traffic. And it's not not really achievable in that way. So they're much more around ingress and egress filtering and understanding uh, if they can identify threats from the control center down or back up again from those sites. And at the same time, they're just dealing with the nature of the politics. So we've got some good organizations like the Downstream Natural Gas ISAC, who's trying to do a lot of advocacy and outreach in that sector. Um, but I, I expect this will be a very turbulent next couple of years for them as they try to figure out how to articulate what the real risk is while minimizing it without letting, as you noted, the hysteria get taken away as congressional members and others start asking questions on, oh, no, what is the threat to this new industry? Well, it's not really new, but this industry that's new in its criticality to the electric grid. So fantastic opportunity for them, uh, definite challenges. Uh, but as always, we've got some fantastic people taking on that challenge. And what would be the impact of an interruption of uh, natural gas service? It could be significant. It depends on a lot of factors, but one of the factors to consider is other generation sources of, of power in that region, as well as time of the year. So as an example of, of a particularly bad scenario, if we're talking about the dark uh, sort of months of the year, we're not getting as much in terms of like solar and we move towards solar more in the grid. And we also combine that with it being winter in places like the Northeast or Northwest, you know, a, a significant outage 
could actually have loss of life impact uh, when it comes to people in that region. Now we're not talking about everybody in the region dying, but but nobody should take any loss of life uh, lightly. So we're, we're talking a, a, a number that um, is uncomfortable mostly just because we're talking about people's lives there. Um, so I, I think there's a realistic scenario where an attacker can can make planned and coordinated strikes against uh, pipelines that have real repercussions, but it still is much more difficult and nuanced than than people make it out to be. But the complexity of a natural gas pipeline is not the same as the complexity of the overall grid, which means to take down a giant portion of the grid for any significant portion of time is a very complex problem. It's not as complex in gas pipelines, but it is still not trivial by any stretch of the imagination. Robert M. Lee, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you through the use of artificial intelligence, visit Silence.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.